Have you ever had an experience that was so bizarre, so unusual, that after it took place, you said to yourself, no one's going to believe this? All right, I think perhaps we've had different encounters or different things happening where you're going, ah, oh, this is going to be an interesting one to get people to believe. You know, one thing that they would teach us in film school is that often when you're making a movie or, or something, you, you have to be truer in the film than you would in life. Otherwise, your audience won't accept it. They won't believe it. And if you can't get them to jump on board, it's going to be hard the rest of the movie. Well, there are things like that in life where it just seems a little bit crazy. And it seems like this is not a normal event. Well, in Genesis chapter 39, we kind of have one of these events that seems so unusual in the way that Joseph particularly acts his character that we have a hard time believing it. Well, maybe not us, but if you read a number of different scholars or commentators on this very passage, particularly a lot of liberal scholars will say, there's no way this actually happened. Because Joseph is, is just too good. His character and his integrity, he shows too much integrity. This is not real. In fact, one of the commentators that I was reading was saying how, this is the phrase he used, the storyteller tells us this now. And really, if, if we have a hard time understanding something in the Bible, that's something our sinful hearts want to do. We have to turn it into an allegory or, or sorts. A story that's primarily, uh, the primary purpose of it is to teach us not to do something or to do something. Right? We have lots of different stories like that in our own culture. We tell the story of the boy who cried wolf. I don't think any of us are going, you know, really, there was that boy. His name was Michael, and he lived here, right? We don't think that. We recognize that that's just a, a tale that we, we give on and pass on to children so they won't lie. Well, it, the question is, is this account in Genesis 39 basically just a moral story, or is this really an event that happened in the life of this man Joseph that we've been going through? Well, part of the problem that these scholars, quote-unquote, have is that they don't have any actual evidence to doubt the le legitimacy of this text. They don't really have anything that says that this cannot be true. They just don't think it could be. It's just the character and nature of Joseph and the way he acts that makes them say this could not possibly be be true. So the, the title of this message is Joseph's Integrity, but I, I think what I'd rather call it now is The Unbelievable Tale of Joe. Because this is an unbelievable tale. How can somebody have that much integrity? How can somebody be that strong in their character and who they are? Well, we're going to see that really there's not a big question mark at the end of that. Now, we know exactly what is going on here, and it primarily has nothing to do with Joseph being such a great guy. It has to do with the nature of God. Really, this is a tale that tells us about how good God is and how he holds on to his promises no matter what happens, no matter what circumstances come upon them. So we're going to look at Joseph today. We're going to talk about his character. But I want us primarily to look at what is God doing in this chapter. As we get there, though, thinking about that video we just watched, if you were to be asked that question, what is integrity to you? I want you to think about that throughout this message as well. How do you answer that question? What is integrity? It's a word that we know. You've probably used it from time to time. We recognize it as if you're going to make a list of character traits that are good and character traits that are bad, integrity is one of the good ones, right? That's what we want. In a leader, we want somebody who shows integrity. And in a, in a, in somebody who's going to be a servant, we want somebody with integrity. We want integrity. But what is integrity? 
What is integrity as maybe we think about it in the world? And what is integrity as we see pictured in the Bible? And is there a difference? This uh, Thursday, I've been, I've been going down to take Kate to the, the Taekwondo classes downtown with, with uh, the Kims over there. And um, <clears throat> Mrs. Kim will have me lead the Bible study in the, in the beginning. They do a little Bible study before each class. And uh, this is a question I pose to all the kids on Thursday. What is integrity? And we were using it because they, they've been doing testing this week. All the testing's been going on at all the schools. And so the example was, you know, if you're sitting there and you're doing your test and you can see the other kids next to you, you're really having a hard time with this one question. You can see that one. Teacher's busy doing something. Nobody else around you is really paying attention. You could totally get away with taking that and putting it on your paper. Cheating, ooh, right? But you can get away with it. Nobody knows, nobody's getting hurt. It's just gonna better you. Is that okay? So we were trying to talk about integrity a little bit. And as we were going around and saying why it's not okay and why they shouldn't do that, our primary response always is because we might get caught. Or they might have it wrong, and then it'll be wrong on our paper. Or or maybe other kids will see, and then they'll start to think bad things about me. So our primary response to what true integrity is, generally is, I don't do something, or I do do something, because there could be consequences. Or I don't want a bad thing to happen to me. And if that's the way that we look at this passage and think about integrity, I think we're going to miss the whole point. In fact, there's a big warning when we we get to a story like this. We don't want to do two main things when we look at this passage. Here's your caution. Caution is this. Don't turn this story or don't turn the whole event in the life of Joseph simply into a moral tale. We don't want to do that. One reason is we're going to create legalists. And we do it primarily in our children. Children grow up in church. They hear stories like this. And we tell them, this is what it means. Don't make bad choices. Make good choices. Even if there are bad consequences, make the good choice. We have good intentions, but what we end up doing is we create legalists. Where then on, their whole life is, it's this. I did this many good things and and fewer bad things. Therefore, I'm a good person. And that really falls short of what the gospel is. We don't want to create legalists. We don't want to have a legalist mindset ourselves. And the second problem is we'll never live up to it. We will never live up to that type of scrutiny. So what we end up doing is we either lie to ourselves and say, yeah, I am kind of at that Joseph level. I got this. I I would make the same choices that he made. So we lie to ourselves, or we really have to bring down the standards of what we think goodness and integrity is. We cannot turn this simply into be like Joseph. It, It will not have good effects. One of the reasons is the moral of this story seems to be make the right choice and you'll end up in prison. That's usually not what we teach. But also if we simply look at Joseph's actions, we're going to miss the amazing qualifier that we see throughout. What is this qualifier? Look at verse 2. The Lord was with Joseph. If you actually go through this passage and look at how many times it says the Lord was with Joseph or the Lord did this or the Lord caused this to happen, it becomes abundantly clear that, yes, Joseph has been left alone by his brothers, sold into slavery, but Joseph is not really alone. He's not alone. He's not doing this by himself. He's not causing anything to happen in his own power. The Lord is with Joseph. In fact, oh, it doesn't say it there. My notes, it says here. What do you see in verse 2? 
when it says the Lord. All capitals. Right? Remember, we always try to point that out whenever there's all capitals. That means it's the Tetragrammaton, YHWH, Yahweh. Right? So when, when Moses comes to the burning bush and God says to him, go and tell Pharaoh this, go and tell the people this. And Moses says, well, who should I tell the people who sent me? And God speaks out of the burning bush and says, say that I am has sent you. I am that I am or I will be that I will be. God is Yahweh. He is the self-existent God. I am, meaning I didn't have a beginning. I just always am. I always will be. He is the God that condescends. He speaks to Moses out of this burning bush. So Yahweh also is the God who makes promises and covenants with people. This is who our God is. He's not a God that leaves us to our own devices. He's not a God that says, try your best, and if you don't do good enough, I'm going to get you. He's a God that is actively involved in our lives. He's actively involved in Joseph's life. Joseph, yeah, he seems to make good choices here, and we think this is a, a hero character. But the reality is, if the Lord was not with him, this story would be very, very different. And we would not want to tell kids to be like Joseph. But because the Lord is with Joseph, it changes things. The covenant-making God. Also, it reminds us that God, why is God doing this with Joseph? Why is God leading Joseph to make these choices and to do this? It's because God is remembering his promise that he's already made. He's remembering the promise that he made with Abraham. He's remembering the promise that he made with Isaac and with Jacob. And now he's going to continue his promises. He said to them, your your numbers will be as the stars in the sky and the sand of the the sea. Or the beach, right? Seashore, I guess. Sally sails seashells by the seashore. The point is this, if this famine comes in and wipes them all out, then there's nobody to to promise those covenants to anymore. But God sustains his promises and he works through Joseph to do this. Joseph is not alone. Joseph is not just some great character who can do this by himself. Joseph is a man who is being led by God, the covenant making God. Question is, do we recognize God's leading in our own life? Do you feel like you're being led by God? Do you feel like you're just kind of floating in open water? You don't know where, you're just doing this thing, hoping that you'll land somewhere good. Because that's not a good place to be. Right? We want to be led by God. What's a main way that we could do this? We don't walk outside and say, all right, God, where do you want me to go? You tell me when to stop, and then I'll go this way. Okay. Because right? that's what we tend to do. You know, if you, people say, oh, I want to go on a vacation. So they take a dart and they throw it at a map to figure out where to go. And that's sometimes how we treat God. What should I do? Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Instead of opening up what God has given to us. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, I don't have to just guess. Because in the Bible, we have the mind of God. We have God's will. We have God's word. We have what he requires of us. We have what it means to follow him. Right? We sing it. We say it. Thy word is a lamp unto... Wait, how does it go? That's right. All I hear is... Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Pastors always like to point out... That when you're outside and you have your lantern, I can't see 20 feet ahead of me. But I can see enough to make sure I don't fall into a hole. God will direct us. God will be with us. The question is, are we going to follow his lead? Joseph is not alone in this situation. He comes in. He's being sold by his brothers. Usually, if if we're sold into slavery, your family hates you. They would rather have you dead. I think normally we would say, this is a bad situation. I'm just going to pout. I'm going to 
give up. I'm done with this. Well, what does Joseph do? Because God is with him. He starts to work. He starts to be the best servant slave he can be in this house. So much so that his master looks at him and says, okay, that guy, there's something different about him. There's something that, that, that other of these servants, they don't act like him. They don't do what he does. So I'm going to give him some more responsibility. So much so that he ends up running this whole household, running whatever else is a, a part of this. That's the kind of attitude we should have no matter where we find ourselves. No matter how hard things might seem, I'm going I'm to serve with all my heart. I'm going to do whatever I can do. Right? We see later on in, in Paul's writings, he says, Servants, serve your masters as if to the Lord. We, we need to serve with all that we have. Joseph walks in there. He makes the best of whatever he can. And God is with him. God provides for him. Well, as he's working, Potiphar's wife catches a glimpse of him, decides that she likes him. And here's where I think the story can go wrong as well if we forget something. And this is this. Joseph was really tempted. We want to make light of this and say, well, that was just easy for him. And sometimes in the Bible, because uh, so much can be said in just a verse, we forget. No, this Joseph is a real person. He is a real man living in real situations. This is not something, this is not a cakewalk. Joseph was really tempted. And, and, and something we might do is, is say, we can make light of temptation and sin and say it's not that hard. But, but let me tell you, temptation is very, very hard to fight. If you don't believe that, you're not fighting it. Giving in to temptation is so easy. Indulging in it, it's so great, so wonderful, right? We love it. Aha, no. Fighting temptation is, is hard. As in the book of Hebrews, I think it's Hebrews, where he says, you have not yet fought temptation to the point of shedding your own blood. It's difficult. We live in a difficult world. There are things that come on us all the time, things that come across our eyes, that come into our minds, that we need to get rid of it. We need to run away from it. Then when Paul says, he says in, in, in 1 Corinthians 6, he says to flee from sexual immorality. Flee. What does flee mean? Run. That doesn't mean that's something we can be nonchalant about and say, nah, you know, that's okay. <laughs> I'm going to just walk away and... Run away, he says. Because we don't understand how damaging it is to us. We don't understand how temptation will break us. How it's ruined cultures and it's ruined generations of people. Joseph was really tempted. We cannot make light of that. We have to be aware of the things in our own life that we are prone to be tempted by. That's part of it too, is, is we can get a high view of ourselves because we don't uh, find any joy or find any indulgent feeling in any, a different kind of sin than somebody else. And we have a way of going, well, I'm not like that person. Look what they do. When reality is, is that we need to be honest with our own self and say, this is what I'm prone to. This is the, the category or the type of sin that I am tempted with. It's only when we identify what our problem is with ourself that we can begin to fight it. Again, we can't do it by ourselves. That's why we need to go back to step one, not being alone, but being with God. What are we prone to? What are you prone to? What causes you to struggle? Be honest with yourself and put that thing to death. It's not easy. It's very difficult. But put it to death through the grace of God. 
In this story, we cannot act like Joseph did not really suffer through these events. We can paint up this thing and make it look really great on a cartoon, but the actual suffering that is going on here, again, it's not a cakewalk. It's not easy. The temptation is real. The suffering is real. In fact, we, we, we can go through it pretty quickly. And, and finally, he runs away from Potiphar's wife. Potiphar hears about it, gets upset, and throws him in prison. And that little narrative in verses 19 towards the end seems to go very quickly as well. And it's just the same type of words, right? He throws him in prison. But verse 21, it says, But the Lord was with Joseph. So he's with him again and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the, and the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the, the prisoners who were in the prison. So that seems like that's just the best prison ever. Right? Oh, you get thrown in jail. And it seems like the moment he sits down, the, the guard looks at him and goes, yeah, that guy, I, I got a feeling about him. I got a feeling about him. Why don't you stand up? You sit here. I'm going to go get a donut. And like he's just sitting there reading a magazine the rest of the time. But is that how it really is? No, Joseph suffered in this prison for a time. We actually get a great glimpse of that in Psalm 105. Turn there with me, Psalm 105. Psalm 105 is one of those longer psalms kind of going through the the history of God's people, talking about various and, and important events in the history of God's people. And in verse 16, Psalm 105, verse 16. It says, When he summoned a famine, that's God, when he summoned a famine on the land and broke all supply of bread, he had sent a man ahead of them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. So it says right there, God brings a famine, but he's preparing a way for the people to survive. So he sends Joseph ahead of them to go and prepare for the famine. That's the basic thrust of the story and the purpose behind what God is doing. But what happens? Joseph was sold as a slave. Verse 18, his feet were hurt with fetters. His neck was put in a collar of iron until what he had said came to pass and the word of the Lord tested him. What happened when Joseph was in prison? He was chained up. He was put in bars and, and collars. He had bruises all over his body. He suffered in the way that a prisoner would suffer. And particularly in this day, in, in, in a, a nation like Egypt, who did not care, especially for foreigners, I can tell you that that was not a cakewalk at all. What does it say? Because God was testing him through this time. Let's not run so quickly through stories like this and forget that there is so much that could be said in these details that God gives us glimpses of. Joseph is in prison and it is prison and it is painful and it is hard and it is difficult. And I think perhaps we can read stories like this and although they are meant to give us peace and comfort, we can say, well, that's just great, isn't it? Because it works out so easy for them, but my story is not as happily ever after as it seems like it is here. Because God just seems to be giving Joseph things, and it seems so easy and so great for him. But let me tell you, if you miss the fact that Joseph is suffering, you're missing the fact of the goodness of God getting him through it. He doesn't take it away, but he gets him through it. Joseph really suffered. But throughout these events, Joseph really loves God. He really loves God, and that is what is getting him through it all. Being tempted by Potiphar's wife, being, being, first being sold into slavery by his brothers, then being tempted while he's there, then being thrown into prison and being beaten 
All this stuff seems to happen, and yet he seems to always come out on top. He says, I'm just going to keep working, and God's with me, and I'm not going to give up, and I'm going to keep moving forward. And it's not because he's so great. It's because he wants to serve his God. Right? I, I love pointing out his, what he says when, when Potiphar's wife comes to him. Verse 8, back in Genesis 39, says he refused... He says, my master has no concern about anything in the house. He's put everything in my charge. Uh, He is not greater in this house than I am, nor has kept back anything from me except you. So those are all the consequences, the things that could be gone. But the primary response, why he will not do this, why he will not give into this temptation. How can I do this thing? How then can I do this great wickedness? And sin against God. That's the primary motivation. That's the primary motivation for any type of integrity we think we can muster up. It's not, I don't want consequences. It's not that I don't want people to look at me. It's, I, how can I do this thing and sin against God? Ah. Uh, Everything that we are, everything that we should do and desire really is not found in ourself, but it's found in the God who saves us. It's found in the God who reveals himself to us in such a way we can understand. It's found in the God who sacrifices himself for us upon the cross. The point in the Bible is this. If God is willing to do that for us, is it not an easy thing for us to live for him? As people, we are prone to the dramatic. And so we are often willing to say that we will die for a cause. And I think there are people that will stand up and will say, I'll die for God. I will go to the deepest, darkest jungles. And I don't care what happens or what comes upon me. I'm going to go forth and I'm going to bring his message anywhere. And we go, yeah, we'll die too. But I think that's the easy part. I think the hard part is saying, I'm going to live my life to glorify God. I'm going to wake up every morning. I'm going to go about my business. There's going to be temptations along the way. There are going to be things that I'm going to be prone to and push towards. I'm going to want to be angry and grumpy and hateful. I'm going to want to have... Thoughts in my head. I'm going to want to whatever it might be. But I'm not going to. Because how can I do that and sin against God? Dying for truth in the gospel is one thing. And it's a noble thing. But desiring to live your life to glorify God. That's the tough part. Are you willing to live for God? Jonathan Edwards, you, you might, he's the, the famous Puritan preacher. He um, had resolutions that he would often write. All kinds of resolutions he wanted in his life. And one of his resolutions says this, Resolved that every man should live to the glory of God. Resolved second, that whether others do this or not, I will. Whether or not people around us desire to live for God, we will. So what is integrity? I asked that question in the beginning, and I've been thinking about it all week, trying to formulate something. What is real biblical integrity based off of what is happening here? Well, if we look at the fact that Joseph was not alone, that Joseph really did suffer, that Joseph really was tempted, but Joseph desired to love God with all his heart, I don't know if all the grammar is right in this, but this is what I came up with. Desiring, this is biblical integrity. This is what I came. Desiring to please, honor, and glorify God in all things by following His will and His word and by doing so through the power of His spirit and grace. It's not about, I don't want bad consequences. It's about, I want to honor my God. 
I want to serve Him. I want to do what pleases Him. And it's recognizing I cannot do that in my own power. I can only do that in the power of His Spirit. Let's pray. Father, we do desire to serve you. We do desire to live as people that glorify your holy name. We do recognize that we stumble, that we fall short, that we do not live up.